All right, let's get started today. So this video is all about uh, trying to derive uh, the four vector in relativity. That is, uh, we're used to in regular physics uh, having a lot of our different observables, the different things we can try to calculate, things like this being vectors. Of course, some are scalars, like temperature, but uh, a lot are vectors. And uh, we want to see, is there a way of looking at our coordinates now that we're thinking about time as an additional coordinate, uh, as well as the spatial coordinates? Is there a way of combining time into our normal three-dimensional spatial vectors to create some new space-time vector? That's going to be the, uh, the goal of this video. So to start, let's look at this. We have our uh, normal Lorentz transformations. Let me go x prime is x uh, minus... Uh, over the square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. And time, t prime, we have uh, t minus ux over c squared over square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. All right, so starting with that, let's look at something we know about normal vectors, our regular old three-dimensional or we can think of it as two-dimensional because it generalizes to three. Let's say we have a vector sitting out in space, and so here's the point, here's the vector. Let's call that vector, I don't know, we could call it vector r. And this vector has components x. By the way, the axes here, this isn't relativity, this is just normal space, x and y. So it's got an x component of x and a y component of y. But what if uh, someone else is observing this particular, either it's a location or it's an object that's sitting out in space and we're looking at where is this object located, if we have another observer, and it's useful to think of it as being out in space, who's rotated relative to you, so you see this object with your coordinate system, and you see, oh, it's x comma y away. That's where it is relative to me. Someone else, maybe they're standing right next to you, but they're kind of slightly upside down, or they've been rotated, because, of course, in space, there is no prime direction, what is the x direction and what is the y direction. So maybe their coordinate system is rotated somewhat so that they have their x like this and their y like that. So they have x prime and y prime axes. And maybe their axes are rotated relative to you by an amount theta. And so they would say their coord the coordinates of this object, this location, relative to them, well, it would be here. That's their x prime. And then, of course, y prime is over here. There's their y prime. And so it's useful sometimes to try to figure out, to try to calculate, what would your friend, who's rotated relative to you, say their x and y coordinates are. Or I should say the x and y coordinates of the object they're looking at. Their x prime and y prime. And it turns out you can either, if you've never seen this before, you could try to derive it yourself. It's not that complicated. There's different ways of, of deriving this, but we get the transformations that say x prime is going to be uh, your x cosine theta uh, plus your y sine theta. And their y prime is going to be, uh, let's see, it's minus your x sine theta plus your y cosine theta. 
So that's how the normal rotational transformation goes with vectors. And of course, you may see this as a matrix uh, transformation as well. But basically, these are how you transform from one coordinate system into a rotated coordinate system, with the origins being at the same point. And now notice something here. Notice we have a very, very similar nature. You've got x prime, so this person's x coordinate is kind of a combination of your x and y coordinates. So your x and your y kind of rotate into each other, kind of uh, combine with each other to give them their x coordinate. And the same goes for their y coordinate. Your x and your y kind of transform into each other, rotate into each other. And so their coordinates are a mixture of your coordinates. And if you look at the relativistic, the Lorentz transformations, it's very, very similar. This person's x coordinate is a mixture of an x piece and a t piece, right? So you're kind of going with x over square root of 1 minus v squared or u squared over c squared. That's kind of like x cosine theta. And minus ut over 1 minus uh, v squared over c squared square root is like the y sine theta, right? And the same goes for the t prime stuff. So we have a very, very similar nature, not exactly the same. And the minus versus plus, that's not really important either. It's just that we have a very similar form where 1 over square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared kind of acts like a cosine theta transform. And u over square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared kind of acts like the sine theta. Not exactly. They're not the same, but it's similar. And so because vectors, and that's almost the definition of a vector by a mathematician, is something is a vector by how it transforms. And here we have these two coordinates, x and t, transforming very, very similar to how normal vectors transform. So if this is the case, then let's create a vector with these coordinates, this new kind of vector, and see what happens. Now the problem is with normal vectors, so you have, you know, vector x, or let's say vector r has coordinates, uh, you know, x, y, and z. Well, we want to do the same with our new vector. Let's call it, uh, I don't know, let's call it s, just to have a name. But we want to include t as a coordinate now, because we're kind of pretending like space is actually space-time, and time is just a fourth coordinate that goes along with x, y, and z. So it turns out uh, it wasn't standardized always, and in fact it still isn't necessarily purely standardized, whether t is the first element or t is the fourth element, but usually you'll see t go front uh, in modern days. Sometimes, if you look at an old textbook or you look at some professors, sometimes you'll see that they make time the fourth component rather than the first. But for us, we're going to have time as the first component here. The problem is, if we try to do this, t, x, y, and z, this can't work. And you should think about why this can't work. Why does this not make sense? And the answer is quite clear. If you have a vector, then each component of the vector is of the same sort. That is to say, if you have a, the position vector, then each of the coordinates of that position vector are positions or distances. If you have a velocity, each component is a velocity. So that is, they have the same units. Well, here we have, we've tried to create this new vector, but look at the components. Three of the components are spatial, so distances, that's fine. But the fourth component, or the first in this case, time, that's got units of time, different units. So we can't have the vector like this. 
We have to have each component have the same units for it to be an actual vector. So we have a choice. We can either modify the time coordinate to give us the correct units or modify the other three coordinates to give them the same units as time. We can do either one. Generally speaking, you'll find that it's the time component that gets modified. And so we need to figure out how do we make time, which is units of seconds, to have units of a distance. Uh, well, the clear answer, of course, is we could just use the fact that velocity is distance over time to say if I want distance units, then I just multiply time by a velocity. So now all we have to do is say, okay, instead of writing t as our coordinate, it's going to be vt. Now we have the correct units. The problem is what velocity should we use for this, uh, transfer, this modification? Well, again, we have some options. Uh, for instance, if you realize what it is we're trying to calculate, generally speaking, you have two observers that are moving relative to each other. So one observer would say the other observer was moving with speed u. Then maybe what we want to do is multiply t by u. The problem with this is that if we multiply t times u, it does give us the right units. The problem is not every observer agrees on what u is. So that is to say, if you have multiple observers all watching the same event, and each one is moving with different velocities, let's say, each person is going to say, oh, that object was moving with this velocity, or that velocity, or some other velocity. So this isn't constant for everybody. Well, this is bad. We don't want that kind of a situation. So what we want to do is similar to what you do generally in, in kind of uh, differential equations, which is in differential equations, when you write out your equation, it's very useful to make it dimensionless. That is, you take some standard length or some standard time that's appropriate for that problem and make all distances and times ratios and so you're unitless, you're dimensionless, and now your answers don't depend on uh, this particular value or that particular value. Well, here we're doing something similar, not the same. We still have units. However, what we want to do is multiply this time by some velocity which everybody would agree with. And, of course, that velocity would have to be the speed of, uh, the speed of light, speed of time. So what we want to do is now make t c times t. Okay, c, that's meters per second, times seconds. We have units of meters. That's good. Everybody agrees, no matter how they're moving, that light travels with speed c. So everybody would agree that that's the correct particular uh, modification. So if this is the case, let's look back at our Lorentz transformations and see how can we rewrite them so that everywhere I see a t, I now have ct, because ct is going to be our coordinate, not just t anymore. So let's look. x prime, if we remember, that was x minus u times t over square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. So if I want to get ct instead of just t, then what I have to do, of course, is multiply c over c, which doesn't change anything. Of course, c over c is just 1. But now this becomes x minus, uh, let's say, u over c times c times t over square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. So now we have ct sitting here, which is nice. What I want to do is call ct, I'm going to call that the, the first component of our new 4 vector, and kind of taking a page out of computer science book, we make the first component the zeroth component. So we're going to call t x sub 0, right? So here, or not t, but ct. So now 
our S is going to be composed of uh, four coordinates, excuse me, CT, X, Y, and Z, which I can rewrite as X sub 0, X sub 1, X sub 2, and X sub 3, right? Instead of calling them X, Y, Z, and CT, we could call them X0, X1, X2, X3. So the CT I'm going to call X0. This X, so that's X0. X is just X1. And then I'm going to make another modification, which is I'm going to call U over C, because this is going to pop up frequently. I'm going to call that beta. Just renaming it so I don't have to write U over C. I'm just going to write one symbol for it. That's all I'm doing there. And so with all of those changes, what do I get? I get X prime, so that's X1 prime, is equal to X1 minus beta X0 divided by square root of 1 minus, notice here, U squared over C squared, that's U over C squared, which is beta squared. So this is just beta squared. And now I have rewritten my Lorentz transformation for x prime using the new values, the new kind of names of our coordinates, x1, x0, and so on. So there's 1, and now we want to do the same for the time one. So if we start with time, that's x sub 0 prime. Well, we remember that's x sub 0. Or, let me not write that yet. I don't know what it is. It's t minus ux over c squared over square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. All right. And again, I want to uh, get c's everywhere, or ct, not t. So again, before I go ahead and call this, I should just call it t, uh, t prime. So I don't want t's, I want c times t. So let me multiply the left and the right by c. So I get it. So multiply this by c and this by c. So I get ct prime is equal to c times t minus u over c squared. Uh, not c squared, let's do u over c times x over c. And that's times c. So remember, every term on the top has to be multiplied by c because they're adding. And all of that is over square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. And now let's look at what happens here. This c cancels that c. I've got a u over c squared here. That's a beta. I've got a u over c here. That's a beta. And then I've got c times t. That's an x naught. And I've got a c times t prime. That's an x naught prime. So now I have it, x naught prime is equal to x naught minus beta times x1 over square root of 1 minus beta squared. And now that along with the other one I just did over here for space, x1 prime is x1 minus beta x naught over square root of 1 minus beta squared. And then, of course, the other ones, x2 prime and x3 prime, they don't change. You don't, they don't get boosted in this Lorentz transformation. So it's just x2 and x3. And look at this. This is very nice. If you look, these two transformations now are symmetric. You have x0 prime is x0 minus beta x1 over the square root, and x1 prime is x1 minus beta x0 over the square root. Whereas before, for the original Lorentz transformations, they're not exactly symmetric. You've got x minus ut, and you don't have t minus ux. You have t minus ux over c squared. So it's very close, but it's not quite the same. Whereas now, rewriting in the new coordinates, where all the coordinates are of equal units, now we have it nice and symmetric, so it looks very nice. And also, this use of beta is quite frequent in plenty of textbooks.
you always see gammas and you always see betas when you do special relativity or when you read textbooks and things like this. So if you've seen beta before, that's what beta is. It's just redefining u over c or giving it a symbol so you don't have to write u over c a whole bunch of times. All right, so now we've successfully rewritten our Lorentz transformations using these coordinates. The reason I wanted to do this is because now what I want to do is create the vector, the four vector, four vector in special relativity, which is if you have some thing, S, some vector, it has units, or it has coordinates, uh, x0, x1, x2, and x3. Okay. Now, the next thing you want to do when you have vectors is, it's very important, is to see what is it that's constant, that is to say, what is it that does not change no matter who's observing it. So if you have some event occur, or you have some object sitting over on the ground somewhere, and you've got a whole bunch of people standing around in different places, and they all look at where that object is, no one's going to agree on where it is. One person says, well, it's two meters to my right, and three meters uh, forward. Another person will say, no, it's not. It's one meter to my left, and three meters forward. And then someone else may say, no, it's not. It's just sit right in front of me. It's zero meters away from me because they're standing right where it is. So everybody has different versions of their coordinates for where an object is. But let's say everybody's standing in exactly the same location, or maybe we're out in space again. So everybody's in exactly the same location, so everybody's origin is the same, but everybody's kind of rotated a little bit from each other. And so... When you say where the object is and where I say the object is, again, there's different components. However, what is definitely always true is how far away the object is, right? So if you have this coordinate system and here's an object right there, this person would say, well, this object is this far away, R. The way I get R, Pythagorean theorem, I get my y and my x, and I do square root of x squared plus y squared, or, in other words, r squared is x squared plus y squared. But then uh, someone who's rotated, so this person, let's say they have a rotated coordinate system like this. Rotated by an angle theta. They would look at this object and say, okay, well, this object has some x prime and some y prime. And so they'd say their distance, so the distance from their coordinate to where that object is, their r prime squared, is their x prime squared plus their y prime squared. Okay? Everybody agrees, yeah, that object is exactly 20 meters away from me. However, one person says, yeah, it's 20 meters away, or even an easier number. Everybody agrees it's 5 meters away. One person says that means it was 3 meters to my right and 4 meters up. But someone else who's rotated says, no, it's not. It was 4 meters to my right and 3 meters up. They both agree it's 5 meters away. The distance formula is true for everybody who's rotated, as long as they're standing in the same location. So everybody agrees how far away it is, but everybody has different coordinates to get there. So what we say is the distance to an object is an invariant. So distance in normal three-dimensional space is an invariant in rotation. Right. Of course, if you have translation, if you move closer to the object and now you stand there, obviously it's a different distance away. But if everybody has the same origin and they're just rotated relative to each other, then the distance to an object is an invariant. And this invariant is x squared plus y squared 
plus z squared if we go three dimensions. Right? That's the invariant to rotation. So we've just discovered a new vector, this four vector thing, which has four components, a time component or time-like component, and then the three spatial components. So is it possible that this is also true as an invariant for a four vector? That is to say, is x naught squared plus x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared an invariant? Now, it doesn't matter. You know, we could be in a 10 dimensional space and we want to find the distance to an object in a 10 dimensional space reality, the Pythagorean theorem uh, can generalize. So if we didn't have the relativity stuff, if we're just doing normal spatial rotations, and but we're in higher dimensional reality, then x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus w squared plus v squared plus a squared plus b squared, doesn't matter, you just keep adding them on, that's still an invariant. It's always an invariant. The number of dimensions will tell you how many of these uh, components you have to add the squares of. Okay? But in relativity, does this hold? You know, we've gone to four dimensions, that's fine. So if this is just four dimensional space and it's x, y, z, and w, this would be true. But in special relativity, where x naught is not truly a spatial thing, we're now doing rotations in space time is this an invariant? And it turns out the answer is no. This does not work. Now, I would ask that you try to do this yourself. Actually write it out. Take these Lorentz transformations as we have them here. Take these Lorentz transformations. Take the square of each for the x prime, uh, x0 prime, x1 prime, x2 prime, and x3 prime. Square all of them, add them together, and see what you get. And then do the inverse transforms, and so the x0, x1, x2, and x3 without the primes. Square all of those, add them all up, and see what you get, and see if they match. And it turns out they won't match. Uh, however, we want to find out what does match. What is the invariant for special relativity? And it turns out the invariant is x naught squared minus x1 squared minus x2 squared minus x3 squared. Sometimes what you'll see is this is written as x naught squared minus r squared, where r vector is our x1 plus x2 plus x3. Or I shouldn't add them. It's the vector x1, x2, and x3. Okay. So if you take all of these added together, that's the same as your normal distance, your normal Pythagorean theorem, but instead of adding them, adding the squares to the time component, you subtract them away. And of course, if we're not in pure four dimensions, if we're doing kind of these more simplistic problems where we just have x and t, then it's x naught squared minus x1 squared is the invariant. Okay? And for this, I again suggest you try to do this yourself. Do you indeed find that x naught squared minus x1 squared is the same as x naught prime squared minus x1 prime squared? Okay? And what you'll find is they do agree. They are the exact same thing. Everything else cancels out, and you're left with this when you try it. So definitely do it. You should at least do it once just to make sure you can go through it yourself and force yourself to believe that this is indeed true, because it's kind of awkward. We're so used to doing the sum of squares for Pythagorean theorem, but it turns out that for the Lorentz transformation, which is very, very similar to rotation transformation, but it's just not the same, it turns out you have to subtract the squares rather than add the squares. So what we usually say 
is this invariant, this thing, x naught squared minus x1 squared minus x2 squared minus x3 squared, that thing we call the space-time interval. And that is what will be the same for everybody. Whether you're primed or unprimed, you put your values of your four coordinates in squared, subtracting the spatial ones and adding the time one. And you're going to get some number, so that means it's a scalar. And that number is the same for everybody. Everybody would say, yes, the, the answer is 8. Even though everybody will have a different x naught and a different x2 and a different, or same x2, but a different x1. Everybody have different values of those things, but when you add the squares and subtract the squares like this, the total answer is the same. And now, once we have this, now we can do a whole bunch of problems in relativity because we already understand the mathematics of vectors. All we've done is create a vector out of this thing, out of these new relativistic coordinates, once we have vectors and we know how the vectors transform correctly and we know what the invariants are, then we just do our normal vector addition, vector calculus, all this kind of stuff to get the same kind of answers we've done before in regular physics. Now, by the way, if we're going to talk about this invariant in terms of vectors, let's see what this means. Uh, what operation gives us the invariant? Well, if you think about in regular normal vectors, not four vectors, the uh, r squared is x squared plus y squared plus z squared being a constant, the way you get it is you take the dot product of r with itself, right? You take the r vector multiplied by the r vector by dot product, and what does it give you? Well, it gives you rx times Rx, plus Ry, times Ry, plus Rz, times Rz, which indeed is exactly that. So if you want the distance, if you want the magnitude of a vector, or the square magnitude, the distance, you take the dot product of that vector with itself, and then of course you can take the square root to get the distance. Well, in four vectors, in relativity, this Invariant is not that version of the dot product, but this version of the dot product with negatives. So for four vectors, we define the dot product as, uh, you know, R dotted with R, or let's make it S. S dotted with S as four vectors. Well, that's going to be uh, uh, s sub 0 times s sub 0 minus s sub 1 times s sub 1 minus s sub 2 times s sub 2 and s sub 3 times s sub 3. Okay, we're defining it this way. So just like we define the divergence or the curl or the dot product and, and, uh, and things like this, we define how to do the operation. The dot product was defined as take each component, square each component, and add them together. Well, here we're defining the new version of a dot product for four vectors, not as taking the square of each component and adding them, but rather taking the square of each component and subtracting them. Of course, you're adding the time, but all the other ones are subtracted. Okay? So be careful about that when you're doing relativity. Uh, and you're talking about four vectors, when you get that version of the dot product, the inner product here, we're doing a different version. You're not adding the squares, you're subtracting the squares. All right, so that's that for uh, creating the uh, four vector in special relativity. Of course, we could go further with this and start doing a little vector calculus and say once we know uh, our four vector, maybe what I want to do is find the velocity. So, for instance, you have an object here 
at some time, and then it goes over here at some other time. So this is time one, this is time two, and it moved from place to place, let's say, in a certain amount of time t. And you say, well, if I want to know the speed of that particle, the velocity of the particle, what I would usually do is the derivative of that uh, position over time, and that gives me the velocity. So I'm going to want to do the same kind of thing in this new four vector. Uh, take the derivative of the four vector with respect to time to get this kind of velocity thing. The problem is what we're going to find when we go to do it is t, remember, everybody is going to disagree on the time. So if I try to take the derivative of this uh, position, of the, the particle's position with respect to time, the question is, whose time should I use? And if I use my time as an observer stationary, uh, I would get a different answer than if you use your time as an observer who's uh, along with the particle. So what we're going to want to do is try to find uh, a way of doing these derivatives with respect to something everybody agrees with. And of course you can see uh, by what I just finished up in this last thing, this thing is an invariant. Well, that means everybody agrees on what its value is. So maybe I could find some way of using that as the thing about which we'll do the derivative. Okay, so instead of derivative with respect to time, we're going to do a derivative with respect to some new form of time that everybody agrees with. And it's going to be called the proper time. That's the time that this particle that's moving, what his particular clock would say. And so what we're going to do is go to this velocity is going to be the derivative of our vector with respect to, not time, but this thing called tau, the proper time. The time everybody says is exactly the same for everybody. And once we do that, everybody will agree with these derivative values. And so then we can start doing some mathematics, some calculations. And this is eventually how we get to E equals MC squared. Because what we're going to find is if we could do a derivative of our four vector with respect to a time, a proper time, that's going to give us something like velocities. And once I know velocities, I could get momentum by saying mass times velocity gives me momentum. But we're going to have four components of momentum, just like we have four components of space, quote unquote space time. And so it's like, well, okay, I know X, Y, Z components of momentum. Those make sense. What the heck is the time version of momentum? And what we're going to find is that happens to be energy. And from that, the value of the energy component, the time component of momentum, the energy, is going to have built within it this whole E equals MC squared thing. That's where it comes from. So that'll be for next time. For now, though, I hope this was helpful how, first of all, why we even want to do this. We notice that the coordinates in relativity transform in a very similar nature to how normal spatial components uh, transform by rotations. If that's true, then can we find a way of creating a vector? Because if those coordinates transform as vectors, then surely this new thing will also transform like a vector. But we have to get the units correct so that every component of the vector has the right units. And so we come up with this new form of our Lorentz transformation having x naught, x1, x2, x3, and betas in it. But it's exactly the same thing. Once I know that, now I say I have a vector which has four components. First component is the time-like component, the CT and the other three components are normal spatial components. And then we want to find the invariant, just like we do in regular three-dimensional space. The distance to an object is constant to everybody who's rotated about each other. So what's the invariant for 
special relativity, it turns out it's not the same, it's not the sum of the squares, but the difference of squares. Now that we have that, we call that the space-time interval. Everybody agrees on what the value of the space-time interval is, no matter how they're moving. And so we have now derived our four vector. Once we know that, all the mathematics of vectors we're going to be able to do, and thus we're going to be able to predict and solve problems. Okay? So anyway, I hope this is helpful. I will see you next time.